The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So um, Ed's talk made me think about uh, in, in 1979 when, when Voyager first went by Jupiter. I was in I was in ninth grade, um, and but I was I was you know a geeky space kid in ninth grade, and I I watched the the images coming down. They had it on PBS. You could just sit and watch the images coming down, and it was the most amazing thing in the world. And so the question of like how could you stay doing this for 35 years? Like this is why many of us younger people. I'm one of the younger people sort of in the room, um, are here because of those, uh, those incredible things that have been coming from Voyager for all that time. And it really is what got me uh, first really hooked. And so uh, I, I just, I, I, I love seeing Ed Stone talk about Voyager. I'm gonna talk about um, a story that also started, at least the Caltech version of it, started, believe it or not, in 1977. Um, I'm going to talk about the exploration of the outer solar system, the discovery of, of things in the outer solar system. Everybody knows that the first um, thing out beyond Neptune discovered was, uh, was Pluto back in, in 1930, and that was actually not done at Caltech, shockingly. Um, but the next object in the outer solar system, the next new object in the outer solar system that was discovered after Pluto, anybody know what it was? It was not Quarwar, that was, that was old. No, no, it, but, it's, but it almost starts the same way. It's Chiron. Um, Chiron is a, we call it a centaur. It's between um, Saturn and Uranus these days. And it was discovered by Charlie Cowell in 1977. Go. Um, and, and there he is. And it was discovered at the 48-inch telescope at Palomar. Um, Charlie Cowell was looking for Planet X. It's this thing that crazy people do. Um, they want to find... Find, find things out beyond Neptune. And he took these photographic plates at the 48-inch telescope and found little things that move and look a little bit blurry. And this was the first discovery, the first new discovery. And there it is, object discovered in space, as you can see. Um, <laughs> they're just outside of, of Saturn and, and Pluto here in 1977. Nobody knew what it was. Um, and uh, it, was, it sort of stayed there as just as this weird object for many years. Um, these days, we filled in a lot more objects discovered in space. And uh, here's, here's, for perspective, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune orbits. Chiron is that one right there. Um, Pluto is actually that little blue one right there. And as you can see, the outer solar system is, is chock full of, uh, of objects. Many of these are very small. Um, and we have been using these objects and where they are in space, how they go around the sun, uh, how, they have, how, how they have been influenced by the giant planets to really understand the, the history of the outer solar system. A lot of the time when I give talks, I, I then talk about some of these ones that were discovered here, these largest of those objects in the outer solar system. One of those wasn't discovered here. I keep forgetting which one. But all the rest of them were discovered here. Um, and each one of these truly is an interesting little body to talk about, about what's going on on the surface, how the atmospheres are behaving, how the geology might be going, what's going on with the moons. And I'm not going to do that today um, because I want to talk about uh, what I really think is next in the even more distant solar system than, than the places that we mostly have been discovering for now. And for that story, it's a, it's a story that's, that's a decade old at this point. So if you've heard me talk about this sometime in the past decade, um, tough. But uh, the story is going to be <laughs> mostly about Sedna and things like Sedna and what they are going to tell us about the outer solar system. First, let me show you what Sedna is. Sedna, here's the, this, the outer solar system. Again, this is, I'll, I'll keep on calling this, is the Kuiper belt out beyond Neptune. And, and these things inside of Neptune are things that used to be out in the Kuiper belt, and they did the opposite of Voyager. They got a slingshot in and, uh, and came in this way. So all of these things used to be part of the Kuiper Belt. And back in uh, 2002, we discovered this object that was really, really far away. And per for perspective on really, really far away, uh, there's Voyager. Um, you can't quite see it, but do you see it up there? Way up there. That's Voyager. So it's about the same distance as, uh, as, as Voyager is right now. Voyager's a little further away. Um, and we discovered this thing in 2002, and you know, what the heck is it? it uh, our, our first question really was, it, what, what sort of orbit is it going to have around the sun? Is it going to have a circular orbit? You know, you can really see it. These, the, the planets here 
are all in these nice circular orbits. Uh, all of those other little dots, those Kuiper Belt objects, are on orbits that are tilted and eccentric and all over the place. Um, so it's a really good indicator of, of sort of how massive the object is, what sort of orbit it's going to have. So we were curious if it had a circular orbit or if it really had one that just uh, came in close to the Kuiper Belt but had gotten flung out further. And so to, to find its orbit, we actually had to go back in the past and find old images of it in the past, which was kind of a fun project to do. And the answer is, remember, two big questions. Is it circular or does it come in? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, so that's its orbit does not come in at all. It's almost as close as it ever gets, and it goes much further out. It has about a 12,000-year a orbit around the sun, and we just happen to be catching it um, just when it's close by. We don't just happen to be catching it when it's close by. It's the only time we could possibly detect it. Okay, so this is a strange object. Um, it never comes close to the inner part of the solar system. The inner part, when I say inner part, I mean Neptune and inside. That's sort of different than most other people, I think. But, the, um, but it, never comes, it never comes close to Neptune. Um, it never comes inside the Kuiper Belt. It spends most of its time, all of its time, out in this uh, interstellar space that you just heard about. And so the big question is, how the heck did it get there? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, walk you through some basic planetary science, like I would, I would do in a, a, a class on, on orbital dynamics. And I would first show you, the, the first question to, to ask yourself is, how do comets get into the very outer region of our solar system in what we call the Oort cloud. Comets are much further away. The Oort cloud is much further away than, than Sedna that I just showed you. How do they get there? And the story is something like this. Uh, let's say this is the orbit of Neptune and uh, that there's starts out, there's a Kuiper belt object very close to Neptune, but then it gets too close to Neptune and it takes one of those gravitational slingshots and it goes out like this. Well, if you get a gravitational slingshot right here, you go out, but you always come back. You can't, unless you get kicked to totally out of the solar system, you always come back to the place where you got the kick. It's like a dog or something, I guess. Um, so you come back by again, and eventually you'll get another kick, and you'll go out again. Maybe you'll go in, maybe you'll go out. Come back by again, maybe you'll get another kick. Come back by again, okay, so maybe you're now ejected from the solar system. So that doesn't help us very much. But what might happen is rather than uh, on your way out here, as you're about to be ejected from the solar system because you got kicked too hard, Something else interesting happens, and uh, a star comes screaming by kind of close, and that star gives you a little bit of a kick. Now your kick happened out here instead of in here, so you have to come back to here, but you don't have to go back to there. So what does that mean? That means your orbit can now do something like that. And this is something, uh, this, is, this is what happens to get you out into the Oort cloud, that very, very distant um, reservoir of comets. So let me, I'm going to show you now in a little bit more sophisticated, but only a little bit more version, and I'm going to show you a ton of these plots, so pay attention for the next 30 seconds while I explain it, and then you'll, you'll be okay. Um, <laughs> this is how far away the object is, how, how far away the, the, the radius of its orbit, basically, the average distance, and this is on a log plot, so here's, and these are in 10 AU, those same units that Ed was just using, so this is 10, 100, this is as far away as a lot of things are. 1,000, that's as far away as Sedna ever gets. 10,000, 100,000 out there. So, and this is the distance when it comes in its closest approach to the sun. So something that's on a circular orbit, its average distance and its closest distance are the same. So circular orbits would be this line that you see right here. These four lines are the giant planets. The giant planets are at 5 AU, 10 AU, uh, 20 AU, and 30 AU, basically. So, if I start out an object, I'm going to start out a little comet right here, and I'm going to let it evolve. As it goes around the sun, every time it goes around the sun, if it's where the giant planets are, it might get a kick from the giant planets. Remember what those kicks from the giant planets do? They, they elongate it, but it comes back to the same place. That means its average distance is getting bigger, but its closest approach to the sun stays the same. This is this. So this object is getting kick, 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 kick. Its average distance is getting bigger. Its average distance is getting bigger. But as you get further and further away, the other thing I'm doing is throwing stars at you at about the same rate that the galaxy throws stars at us. And if you're far enough away, those stars can give you another little kick that change, they change your closest approach to the sun. This one is not very interesting. It goes out, it goes out, it rattles around a little bit. It's gone forever. These are all just totally random processes. You never quite know what's going to happen when you start one out. Here's another one. 
gets kicked around a little bit, elongated, elongated, then it gets far enough away from the sun that a star coming by happens to give it a little bit of a kick that pulls its closest approach away from Neptune. Once its closest approach is above the orbit of Neptune, it no longer has any, any problems with Neptune and it can just continue to evolve basically from stars forever. And this one rattles around for four billion years and ends up way up in, the, in this region on a very far from the sun on a very eccentric orbit, but no longer crossing the giant planets. Other ones do things like this. There's another one. I like this one because it goes out for a while. It goes up. It comes back down, it goes up, it comes back down, re-encounters planet, and finally it goes up, and then it just sort of evaporates out the edge of the solar system. These things, these, is, these are what really happen in comets all the time. There's another one that sort of does the same thing, goes up, rattles around for a while. They, it's, it's kind of fun, you just run these on the computer and watch them and be like, oh, that was, I, I spend way too much time doing this because it's entertaining. Um, <laughs> So, but it's much more interesting not to look at the individual ones, but to look at the ensemble. Where do all of these things go if you let them evolve over all this time? And the answer is they fill in space that looks sort of like this. I started out all the objects around in here. They rattle around this way, and when they get far enough away, they start to go up. And then they end up up there. The black ones are ones that are still alive, but they rattle around all through there. This plot also shows you actually something pretty cool unintentionally, which is where comets come from. Comets are things that started out up here, got a kick from a star, and got kicked back down, and then their closest approach to the sun is down here. This is, this is where the Earth is. So these, these, these red things down below here are comets that we would see, and you can see their source. That's the Oort cloud. Um, so that was a, a big digression to show you the interesting thing about Sedna, which is Sedna sort of has that same characteristic, right? It it's really far away, it has an elongated orbit, and it has a perihelion, closest approach to the sun, that is above the giant planets, which is unusual, but it's not that unusual. That's what comets do, but Sedna's a little weird because Sedna is right there. Uh, it's the Bermuda Triangle of the outer solar system. There is, there is no way to get an object where Sedna is in the current solar system. And since there's no way to get something there, there's also no way to get rid of it. Sedna will stay there more or less forever, minding its own business. Um, it's a fossil record of something, something that put it there. Now, there, there are a lot of different ideas um, on how you could possibly have gotten Sedna to this location here. The one that I like the best, because it's something that, that uh, uh, astronomers and, and even geochemists have been talking about forever, um, is that Something that, that we know as, as astronomers that, 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 that most people don't ever really think about is that the sun probably formed in a cluster of stars. Uh, might have looked sort of like this. Um, the sun most likely didn't form all by itself with no other stars around. The, the sun probably formed and there were a ton of other stars very nearby. At the end, I'll tell you how nearby I really think it is. If the sun formed in a cluster of stars, you know, remember I told you I was throwing stars at those things. Well, I should have been throwing about a thousand times more stars because they got that much closer. If you do that, you take the same ideas that I had before and now notice these things jump up faster than they did before. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. Sometimes they, well, here's, here's all of them. Uh, if there are a thousand times more stars, then you don't have to be nearly as far away from the sun before you start to get pulled away from the planets and you get up in this region here. What I think this means is that Sedna is a fossil relic of the initial formation of the sun in a cluster of stars. And fossil, fossil is actually a really good word for it because it's, it's fossilized, it can't move anymore. It's been stuck there in place for four and a half billion years or actually longer, you know, since, since when, as, the, as, the, as everything was being formed, it got stuck in place out through there with all these other stars out through there. And it's also an interesting fossil record in the sense that, you know, you, can, you, you find one fossil and what you really want to do is find the rest of the pieces of the fossil, put it together and really understand what this whole beast was. This whole beast, if this really is the story for what formed this, this whole beast is, the birth of the sun. This is a fossil record of the birth of the sun itself, which is uh, something that is uh, an incredibly profound 
thing to be able to have some observational record of. You know, they, they, when you talk about the birth of the sun and, and a cluster environment of the sun, just going to throw this up here to mention without explaining it. This is something that geochemists uh, Jerry Wasserberg, who you saw on the, the, the video, um, was one of the very first to, to argue that geochemically you could tell that the, that the sun and, and all of its, its uh, elements formed in a cluster. And this is something that the geochemists have been arguing about actively for decades with no input from the astronomers who were like, yeah, yeah, we don't know, maybe it did. And I think we finally have some actual uh, evidence that this really happened. Okay, so I'd like to be able to disentangle this fossil record. Um, and so the first step is to go find more fossils. And we have been trying that first step for 10 years now and um, have been failing miserably. Uh, and I've been, every time I come and give a talk sort of like this, I talk about how this next way we're gonna try is finally the answer. I, we do finally have the answer. We're going to find them. Um, but, but for now, I'm gonna tell you what we can tell you just from one um, object, just from Sedna. If it's really true that we formed in a cluster and that's where Sedna came from, you can already use just that one little bit of a fossil, that one you know, tailbone, uh, to, to say something about the, the, the cluster of stars. If we formed in a cluster of stars that looked something like this, then, now I want you to, oh, I didn't put that plot in there. Remember that, that triangle that I had and the, the Bermuda Triangle that was missing? This is the same plot, semi-major axis and perihelion. Uh, that Bermuda Triangle of missing stuff was all in here. There is Sedna. If we formed in a cluster, just kind of like the picture I showed you right there, this is where the objects fill in. This is a real simulation instead of my toy throwing stars at things simulation. Um, it works, you would find Sedna if you had a cluster that looked like that. If you increase the numbers of stars in the cluster, and here's a tenfold increase in the number of stars, you actually pull things in even closer. Uh, you, you, you allow them to disengage from the giant planets without having to get nearly as far away. And if you go into something really crazy like the Orion Nebula, the Orion Nebula is uh, one of the closest regions of massive star formation and uh, t uh, something like 100 times more stars in there. And there are so many stars in there that actually you have a hard time having anything further away because there are so many stars that uh, everything gets stripped away. For now, I think I can tell you that uh, that first simulation look the best, but I'm going to tell you what we're going to try to do, which is we're going to go to um, one of the biggest telescopes in the world, uh, which we have great access to because we're at Caltech, and it's not either of these two telescopes. Um, these are the two Keck telescopes that, uh, that Caltech uh, has, has been uh, developed and used over the past 20 years, and they are fantastic, but one of the great things that we do at Caltech, in addition to build these massive telescopes, is we have been partnering with other people who build telescopes, other telescopes, so that we can use some of their specialized capabilities. They can use some of our specialized capabilities. And the fact, in, in particular, that we've been um, developing this, this new 30-meter telescope, one of the large partners in the 30-meter telescope is, uh, is Japan. And Japan has the neighboring telescope. This is the Subaru telescope um, from, from Japan. And the Subaru telescope has been specializing in giant cameras that can look at huge swaths of sky. And that's what I love, giant cameras, huge swaths of sky, big telescopes, because that lets you find these objects as much as possible. Their newest giant camera is so big that it's actually bigger than an anime character. Um, <laughs> and it's called, in typical Japanese fashion, it's Hyper Supreme Cam. Um, <laughs> I didn't make that up. So it's on the telescope right now. Uh, we are going to use it um, in, when are we using it? I don't see Ian. He remember, um, we were using it in like six weeks, four weeks. Anyway, it's going to be uh, it's going to be incredible. It's going to see. Um, it's it's sort of like we used to do at the 48-inch telescope at Palmar, but uh, with so much more that uh, it's going to be amazing. So what are we going to see? Well, I think what we're going to do is find many more of those little fossils and really be able to reconstruct not just this idea that hey maybe it was a cluster and maybe it was right here, but I think we'll be able to really um, uh, say it, that that the sun really did form in a cluster and not just say, look, it might have been sort of like this, but we actually formed maybe on the outskirts in this sort of region of a cluster like this. And to me, one of the reasons why, it's, why it's, uh, this is so fascinating is that it, it lets you think back to that earliest stage, the earliest thing we can do as a, as a solar system planetary scientist and, and think about what this environment was like. It's easy to show a picture of a cluster like this and everybody says, yes, pretty stars. Um, 
here's what I want you to know about this cluster of stars, that this is probably something like the environment that we're thinking about that it might have formed in. Um, in this cluster of stars, the, the, if you were sitting here on the Earth when this cluster was there, you, well, you wouldn't because there was no Earth. But if you, were, if you wish you were sitting on the Earth, if you were sitting somewhere and you were looking out into space, uh, the brightest star in the sky um, would be probably about 20,000 AU away. So I, the picture I showed you had Sedna going out to 1,000. And right now, the closest stars are 400,000. At that point, the closest star would have been 20,000, really close. It would have been uh, 100 times brighter than the brightest star in the sky today. So that would, have been, that would be our closest neighbor. The next 1,000 closest neighbors would be brighter than the brightest star in the sky today. There would be 1,000 stars in the sky brighter than anything we have in the sky right now. Um, that, those stars have all gone off into space, and they're, they've mixed with all the other stars in the Milky Way. We'll never see them again. But this process of finding these lets us put these pieces back together and imagine in our heads um, what this might have been like. So I'm kind of excited about this. Thank you. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs>